community planning. Okay, this meeting is being recorded now. So um, I'd like to start over. And I would like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Susan Spies, and I will be uh, the presenter at today's um, annual uh, action plan meeting. And um, I work in the uh, PCD, Planning and Community Development, Human Services Contracts area. So um, with that, um, I'd like to say welcome everyone. And um, the agenda for today, if we could move to the next slide. Thank you, Rachel. The next slide, please. Thank you. Is basically um, welcoming everyone in the community to provide input into the annual action plan for the plan year um, 2025. Um, so that's why we're here today to meet um, with the public to be able to at least put the information together for the annual action plan. Um, we plan on um, asking uh, participants to discuss and make recommendations at the end of the presentation. And um, we are also uh, in um, with the Pima County Consortium. Um, so they'll be uh, doing their piece um, at the end of the presentation as well. Um, our meeting is limited to 60 minutes. And if you're experiencing technical difficulties, please make sure you log out and log back in. And if you want to speak to anyone um, during the actual presentation, please raise your hand to request to speak. All right, moving forward. The next slide, please, Rachel. So the annual action plan is basically um, based around four entitlements that we have, four entitlement programs. The first one is the community block or I should say the Community Development Block Grant, which um, allows us to um, support the thriving urban communities by providing decent housing and a suitable living environment, uh, and by expanding the economic opportunities and um, trying to assist the low and moderate income individuals. The second entitlement program is the Home Investment Partnerships, um, which promote the affordable rental housing and home ownership opportunities among low and moderate income persons. And the third is the Emergency Solutions Grant. Um, this one promotes safe alternatives to the unsheltered homeless, and we also uh, facilitate rapid transitions to permanent housing among people experiencing or at risk of homelessness. And finally, the last entitlement program is the Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS. And this particular program is to assist in reducing the housing insecurity and promoting long-term housing stability among low and moderate income people living with HIV, AIDS, and their families. Next slide, Rachel. So, the HUD entitlement programs have a process and the plans that we go through are first the consolidated plan, which is our five year plan. And um, the new year starts um, this year at the end of this year. So 2025 to 2029 will be the five year plan that we will be discussing um, at the end of this year, early next year. Um, this plan dictates and allows us to establish goals, priorities, and strategies for addressing any identified needs in the community. The annual action plan is based off the five-year plan and it serves as a detailed roadmap for how HUD funds will be utilized to address housing and community development needs for a specific program year. The implementation process uh, is in, started when um, HUD approves the consolidated and annual action plans that have been submitted to them. And that is where we start the implementation process of basically making sure that we uh, create or provide the activities and projects um, that we have selected for the year. And finally, the annual reporting or CAPER process is um, basically uh, taking and assessing the overall program performance uh, 
uh, and accomplishments against the plan goals and objectives. And that is an annual report on these specific four programs. We just identified CDBG, HOME, ESG, and HOPWA. Next slide, please, Rachel. So um, there is a consortium um, between Tucson and Pima County in the HOME program. And um, if we go and look at the next slide, we can see what the funding has been in this last year. So the funding that we're presenting now can have changes. Um, an increase or decrease could proportionately be um, subjected by the HUD overall budgetary changes that we will receive uh, possibly at the beginning of next month. So the activities you'll see here, rental housing development as part of the home investment partnership consortium between city and county. So the city has um, given a million dollars and the county $700,000 for a total in rental housing development of 1.7 million. The tenant-based rental assistance, which includes short-term utility and deposits that assist individuals uh, entering public housing authority programs, uh, the city has contributed $292,000 approximately. Uh, for down payment assistance, which includes forgivable loans to low-income home buyers, the city has um, contributed 500,000. And the community housing development organization set aside amounts, which are to finance uh, affordable home ownership opportunities. Um, the city has contributed 718,000 and the county 155,000. In total between the two, um, the two consortium uh, agencies, it's $874,000. And finally, residential rehab, which is for repair and replacement of mobile homes to benefit low-income homeowners. The county has contributed $75,000. And the planning and administrative piece, the city has contributed $279,000 and the county $103,000, bringing the total between city and county uh, agencies $3,800,000 million, $3,822,766. So that's quite an investment that the city and county are um, actually contributing to these, uh, to the home investment partnership. Next slide, Rachel. All right, so the proposed funding strategy for the um, annual action plan is on the next slide. And what we propose to do is we use the PCHIP program, which is um, basically taking um, and coming up with a strategy on how to spend the funding. Um, we call out to the community for our um, projects that are associated with the um, vision mission of the housing and community development uh, department. And um, we engage uh, through public meetings, through stakeholder meetings with human services, affordable housing meetings, public surveys, and there's a PCHIP budgetary tool that we use and social media engagement events. And if we take a look to the right side, we will notice that we have the survey, um, survey results, which are based upon three categories, people, communities, and homes. The first one is people. And if you notice, um, the largest percentage of the survey results indicate that health services and homeless services, shelter operations are a priority in the survey. The second grouping, which is communities, the largest percentage of the survey results indicate complete streets, trees and green infrastructure, and community facilities are priorities. And finally, homes, the largest percentage of the survey results indicate that affordable rental, rehab and repair, rental assistance, and transitional housing are pr priorities under the PCHIP plan. Next slide, Rachel. The funding priorities for the PCHIP plan are listed as follows to the left. 
um, homelessness, healthcare, food security, um, training, education, and housing, transportation and mobility, and affordable housing. And the targeted populations in this survey are children and youth, people experiencing homelessness, and older adults. Next slide, Rachel. So um, under the Community uh, Development Block Grant, um, there are several um, different categories. The first is human and public services, which um, basically provide education, disability services, legal services, uh, and the total amount of the budget that has been um, uh, given to this particular category is 790,000, which is 15% of the actual uh, budget. The next uh, category is decent affordable housing, which includes homeowner rehabilitation, um, demo de demolition and clearance of, of land. Uh, it could also entail rental housing acquisition and rehabil rehabilitation. And the dollar amount that has been uh, budgeted is 1 million approximately, which is 20% of the budget. The third is community facilities and improvements. This is for special populations, neighborhood facilities, parks and recreation facilities, um, fire stations, equipment, um, and it's at $2.4 million and is 45% of the budget. And finally, planning and administration um, category is at $1 million. In total for the CDBG grant funding is $5.3 million. That's quite substantial for the city of Tucson to uh, uh, send that ca capital um, out to our subrecipients. The next slide, please. Emergency Solutions Grant is the, the second um, item that we are looking at. And it's, it's considered to be um, more for homelessness. Um, and one of the items that we have here is street outreach. So $30,000 is for unsheltered homelessness outreach programs. The second item that we have is emergency shelter, which is basically for low barrier shelter programs for individuals and families. And that's 255,000. Um, rapid rehousing for short term, medium uh, term, rapid rehousing assistance for peace, persons fleeing domestic abuse is for $50,000 and homelessness prevention which is um, utility and rental assistance, supportive services for individuals and families at risk of homelessness, 104,000, and the administrative piece is $36,000, bringing a total of emergency solutions funding of $475,000. The next, um, the next uh, grant that we have is HAFWA, which is Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS. And again, these are all subject to change um, based upon what has been awarded by HUD uh, for budgetary uh, purposes. So the short-term rent mortgage and utility assistance is $370,000 that's been provided for budget and tenant-based rental assistance at $381,000. Supportive services at 221,000, sponsor admin 41,000, and recipient admin by the city of uh, $31,000, bringing a total of $1.43,000 to the actual uh, grant budget. All right, and with that now, I'm going to introduce you to uh, Joel Veers and his team. Um, they will be presenting the Pima County portion. Joel, take it away. Thank you, Susan. Give me just a moment here, hopefully a few seconds to swap screens. There we go. Everybody see that okay? We can, yes. yes. Nice, thank you. Um, I appreciate everybody showing up today, and thank you, of course, to the city for hosting. Appreciate it very much. Um, and you guys have actually made it easy because basically you explain the entire initial process. Um, we have very similar goals, similar process, of course, <coughs> in our program. 
Uh, we do receive just over about half what the city's allocation is. All right, it, again, it's it's the same purposes. Uh, these are laid out by HUD and we go through a process extremely similar. We do community outreach. This is rough, rough chronology here. Annual community planning application is drawn up. The plan defines the relationship between the city of Tucson and Pima County in terms of the five-year consolidated plan, which is coming up uh, again this year. Same sorts of program lines, public services, youth and skills programming, nonprofit staffing, other community resources. This could be things like uh, financial education, um, youth bicycle training, graffiti abatement, things like that. Public facilities and public infrastructure. This is the bulk of our non-home rehab funding that we use. Uh, small capital improvement projects, facility repairs, um, things like HVAC provision, parking lots, things that we, we try to target out mostly to the rural areas. Um, could be anything that really benefits our, our nonprofit partners out um, in, the, in the wider county area. Housing rehabilitation, this is our largest CDBG allocation, largest chunk of funding that we get out. Our in-home program, uh, we run through probably 40 to 50, oh, let's call it medium rehab activities throughout a year. And then we also have currently, I believe, four subrecipient partners who uh, receive CDBG funding kind of to do a little bit different things than we can do. Some of them are more responsive and do small jobs much quicker than we can. Others uh, specialize in uh, one visit uh, home repair, so they'll spend a lot more money than we will. And then we have a partner out in Ajo is the only game in town to help uh, the folks out there. Administration, just like the city, this is um, funds that are used to actually administer the program, the management activities here, bookkeeping, things like that. We only have one local government partner right now, uh, and that's the city of South Tucson, Marana. The town of Marana got their own CBG allocation last year, so uh, they've gone their own way. Better for them. Same process, citizen participation, community outreach, September through November. Um, we go to uh, sessions, uh, both in-person and virtual. We do hit um, Ajo and we hit Aravaca or some of our far-flung uh, communities. Technical assistance sessions, October, November. These are also available at any time if somebody um, feels like they need assistance or, or in fact, if we feel they might need assistance. Little calendar there, pre-application released. Uh, full application was due the end of January. We've done our initial review. We've had our review committee go through them and submit their recommendations back to us. These uh, will start the public comment period. And then once that closes, these will be forwarded to the Board of Supervisors for hopefully their final approval on that date. 57 applications received this year. Uh, take a look at that number, $6.6 .6 million in requests. That's fairly typical, anywhere from four to six million. That'll make sense when you look and see what we have available. This is our anticipated funding for the upcoming year, about 2.6 million. So uh, obviously there's a lot of slicing and dicing that we have to do bearing in mind, uh, all kinds of different variables on how the uh, the need is perceived, uh, its potential impact, how feasible, how the agency is performed, and so on. You see that number is roughly, the city, correct me if I'm wrong, that, that just slightly over half of what you folks get. ESG, um, that's not my area of expertise. I think a lot of people are familiar with it, and the slides are self-explanatory. This is directed towards homeless and homeless assistance of various kinds, street outreach, emergency shelter, homeless prevention, rapid rehousing, and always a small administration component. Street outreach, th these will be available later if somebody wants to really read over these and dig in a little bit more. Um, yeah. So this year, it looks like we have nothing uh, devoted to street outreach and rapid rehousing. You can see how much money there is in there, 241000 That really doesn't go very far. Uh, so we get uh, many fewer applications for ESG. Obviously, it's more competitive. 
affordable housing and home program. Um, Marcos, the housing and home program manager is on board if he wants to, to chime in briefly. Otherwise, uh, again, this is, this is familiar stuff uh, it done in, in consort with the city. Jointly funded down payment assistance. I don't believe we have any this, this year coming up. It's been spent. Um, gap funding, some uh, notable projects that we've been involved in, Center Hope Apartments, um, over on, uh, well, where is that? Palo Verde and Ajo Way, roughly, in that area. Mobile Home Replacement Program, this is where our flood, flood control district, our department, finds a mobile home that they can purchase outright that's still in good shape. They want to move it out of a floodplain, of course, so they will donate it to us and we will find one of our needy clientele, somebody who's on our waiting list who could use that home and get that to them. Public Housing Authority Consortium, uh, again, the partnership with the city and uh, housing choice vouchers and allocation of tenant-based vouchers, uh, county conversion of up to 120 tenant-based vouchers to PPBs. So again, another important part, I don't think the numbers are, are really very high that Marcos can chime in if you'd like, that it's, it's, it's a handful that we administer. No, oh. no, I think you did a good job there. Um, yeah, we um, we don't have any open uh, RFPs out for the project-based vouchers right now, but um, we have allocated uh, to... Uh, Two projects, the one home at Joel uh, mentioned on South Palo Verde and uh, the Curly School in Ajo. Yeah. And, and it is correct. You have no down payment assistance right now, Marcos. Is that right? Uh, the, the, right now, there is funding available uh, for the program. Um, it's jointly funded between the city and the county. Um, uh, um, I, so, but for next year, we we don't have any funding allocated other than the program income that we receive uh, will be allocated to that okay. uh, program. That, that's that's yep. what I must have meant. All right. Thank you very much. Public comment a period. Again, it's open April 1 to May 6th. Uh, this will be on our website. You can actually make comments on the website as well. The draft annual plan is posted there at that link that the city as well has it posted. The final public hearing will be at a board of supervisors meeting May 7th. They do a good job of covering that virtually as well. Finally, and this will be available, any question about any of this stuff, uh, just let us know. Yvette and Magali down there on the bottom, they handle ESG. Marcus will handle home and any kind of housing questions. Anna generally will handle uh, public service. I'll handle home repair and public facilities. And Joel will try to handle all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joel, appreciate it. So right now, if you want to speak, you can raise your hand and we will call on you. Or if you want to put in the chat, please state your name and organization before sharing your thoughts. Hello, not sure if I can be heard. Yes, we can hear you, Camille, thank you. Thank you, Susan, and thank you all for such a wonderful presentation today. Um, I'm here with the Arizona Center for Empowerment. Um, all of the funding that you guys have talked about for the fiscal year 2025 looks wonderful. Um, I did want to share my input from what we've heard in the community about how they would like to actually see some of the federal funding um, received from HUD allocated um, into covering what they are experiencing, which is a cost of rent increase. Um, the recent report from the GAP, which has stated that 
Um, HUD's fair market rent is currently stated for a two bedroom at $62,252, um, $62,252 as an average mean. Now this is for a family that is ex experiencing extreme poverty. Um, this means that our community members are looking to see not just more vouchers allocated, but that the funds are actually funneled to make sure their rent is, is helping them with that gap um, in, a, in a better way. The other thing I've heard from community members, more specifically property managers who support um, receiving vouchers, Section 8 um, families, is that the support services receive more funding. Uh, they find that the support services not having enough funding has put a strain on the employer, employees within those programs, and their families are not receiving the support that they need. Um, that has been a recent thing that we have come to find through our listening sessions and one-to-ones with community members. Um, it's, it's just a, a big concern and one of our priorities here with the Arizona Center of Empowerment is making sure that everyone has access to affordable housing as well as making sure they can afford their rent. So if this is something we can see you guys um, kind of allocate appropriately, that would be wonderful. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you for those comments, Camille, appreciate it. So Susan, it looks like the next question came in the chat and is from Megan Headings with Family Housing Resources. Megan asks, can the county elaborate on the decision to not put new dollars towards down payment assistance? I recognize there are limited funds, but would appreciate understanding the decision. Hey, Mar Marcos, if you can feel that one, I know nothing about that. Yes. Well, I mean, that's basically the problem is is not enough funding. Um, and uh, we 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 are seeing a, a very high demand for rental projects. Um, and we're, we're also seeing demand for home ownership. But um, we we will out be allocating our program income. And, you know, this is just the first um, draft of our allocations that we put out right now. Um, you know, we, we were hoping to see a bigger allocation of home funds um, from Congress, but that didn't happen. And um, we're also anticipating another allocation of county general funds. And, um, you know, we're, we're pursuing possibilities there as well for um, using those funds for home ownership, uh, including down payment assistance. Um, and um you know we we <clears throat> again um also are are looking at other resources available in the community and um you know recognize that the state has put out a um um a notice of funding availability for down payment assistance as well uh that we're hoping um you know the local agencies can take advantage of in the absence of uh, local resources Thank you, Marcos. And then I'm gonna run a little out of order with questions just cause there's an, a follow-up question to that. And then we'll hit Kim's question and then Jocelyn's. But so the follow-up question there is, do you know the amount that may come in from program income for down payment assistance? I'm happy to field that. The number can really, and sorry, that came question came from Megan Headings with, um, with uh, Fair Housing um, Resources. Um, the, and so, or family housing resources rather. And Megan, the amount really varies year to year based on um, based on revenue that's returned from gap financing loans and can be anywhere from like $150,000 on the low end in a year to half a million dollars or more. Um, so it really varies in there. Um, what we have done, both the city and the county is applied as Marcos has mentioned, applying program income to the down payment assistance program. We also kind of monitor that program and other spending throughout the year. So if um, where you saw maybe 1.7 million dedicated for gap financing. And what can happen sometimes is we obligate that money, then say one of the projects that we went to fund was applying for LIHTC and they didn't get the LIHTC money, then we'll often kind of amend our home budget to put more money into down payment assistance. So 
Um, it all stays a little bit fluid throughout the year. Um, but this past year, we were able to find all down payment assistance and program income alone, both the city and the county. So um, the so now I'll hop back up to Kim Simonton with COPE has a question and then Jocelyn Muzine. So Kim's question is in the chat, wonders if, and is wondering if there is any planning on addressing potential rental increase caps for Pima County. And so Kim, I don't know if you're able maybe to come off mute and just clarify a little what the question specifically is there. Sorry, it looks like there are two Kimberly's in the chat. I allowed one of them to talk. I'll try doing the other one too. I'm here. Thank oh, you. Oh, we can hear you. <laughs> what I'm finding is a lot of our homeless have income. Um, substantial, well, not substantial, but social security income. And have had to move on to the street because of unreasonable rental increases. And I'm finding this, especially in our elderly population, they don't have the 30% increases that they're seeing. You know, they get to make that decision between rent and food. So I, I know that in other states, they've been able to address rental capping. However, I also know that Arizona is very property owner friendly. So I'm wondering what in there can be done through the budget to address that issue, because sure. we're just feeding one problem to the other. Sure. So happy to feel that the, you know, as you mentioned, Arizona is very much um, is very much a an owner's state when it comes to kind of the relationship between um, tenants and property owners. Um, and there are the state legislature has put pretty significant um, controls in place on what local jurisdictions can do. So when you know when you think about in other states where you've maybe heard of like um, you know kind of like rent protected um, units things like that, there are these kind of um, protections that exist in some other states that simply aren't possible under Arizona state law. Um, the and then the other challenge in here, unfortunately, is what where often the most effective intervention is for that that group of folks who have income just not enough right is what's called a shallow subsidy so that sort of ongoing maybe a couple hundred bucks a month to help meet the gap in um in the income to rental cost and um and so we've seen some states like california that's done a major pilot around that with older adults and unaccompanied youth in particular we're seeing it pick up in other states as well Unfortunately, HUD funds are pretty prescriptive into what they can be used for. Um, and none of these, fund, the four funding sources that are entitlements that we're able to talk with you, everyone about today, can be used for an ongoing shallow subsidy um, other than ESG, Rental Assistance Emergency Solutions Grant. And that's for someone who already is homeless. Um, so there's where there's really opportunities to advocate, I think, is when, um, you know, when the city and the county are doing their planning processes annually around how we use our general funds. So how we use those dollars that are not federal dollars, um, there's opportunity in there really to advocate for that kind of an activity. I, I think where I was concerned is if we're addressing potential or at risk families for homelessness, is there some sort of allowance or gray area in there that can be addressed that way? So it's short term generally in homelessness prevention. So looking at maybe one time assistance or a couple months of assistance. It's not an ongoing gap in the way that emergency solutions grant homelessness prevention is currently funded in the state. And a lot of that has to do with the dollar value at that point. So for prevention, it could actually go on for a fair amount of time. But the, the Emergency Solutions Grant is the smallest of the entitlement programs. Um, but I can hear what you're saying. And I think there may be a recommendation there around thinking about increasing homelessness prevention funding. Yes, thank you so much for answering that. Yeah, thank you, Kim. All right, then we've got Jocelyn Muzine has a question. Sure, um, sort of more of a comment. Um, I am the board chair of Tucson Pima Collaboration to End Homelessness. And one of our functions is to monitor the ESG um, grant recipients uh, who receive money for shelter. Um, and I, you said it, Jason, there's not that much ESG money out there. <laughs> um, and so sometimes I think 
Uh, we want to give a little bit to everybody, um, but really want to encourage uh, that we really look at performance um, when we're funding the different programs um, to make sure that we are funding the most efficient and um, productive programs, you know, and that might mean funding some programs more money instead of funding a lot of different programs. So just wanted to add that comment. Thank you for that, Jocelyn. I'm not seeing any other questions or comments in the chat or hands up. Is there anyone else who would like to share input or a question? Okay. We, um, oh, it looks like Betty's hand went up for a moment. Betty, did you did you have something you wanted to share or ask? Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. <laughs> yeah, I discovered my uh, my little camera was off my computer, so uh, I just. Uh, Hope of Glory is interested in, in going forward with a homeless day center, and that would be under CDGB. And I was my question is, would that fall under human and public services or community facilities and improvement? Great question. And it honestly, it depends on what you'd be asking for. So if the organization is um, seeking funding to apply for, like to purchase a property, to um, to make improvements to a property in order to operate services there. Those physical expenses, those would be public facility um, funding opportunities. Um, if what you're seeking is um, funding to actually deliver the services on site, that would be human or public services funding. Um, and I think an important note for everyone to know, at least on the city side, and um, maybe Marcos or Joel, you can share on a, someone um, on the county side where you're at in cycles this year and whether you have an RFP or request for proposals coming out this year. In the city, the way we do our human services grant making is we issue a funding competition each two years, every two years. And on the second year, we renew it, renew our agreements with existing organizations provided that those organizations have been performing well. And so this coming year for us is a renewal year. So there wouldn't be new organizations to be funded out of these dollars for this coming year. We will be in the fall releasing our funding competition, which would begin in the next July, July 1, 2025, and then would run for two years from there. So just want folks to have that kind of clarification from a city perspective. Now on the county side, we do have the annual CDBG ESG application cycle. Um, but we also have a limited number of, of general fund dollars that are available through our outside agency program. And that is a similar, it's a two year program. Um, they have a solicitation every two years to the same portal we do for CDBG. Uh, and then they program that again out for two years. And I, I believe they renew it unless there's some, some issue. I may be wrong. Perfect, thanks so much. All right, and with that, it looks like Megan had the next question. You need to unmute Megan. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Thought yeah. I, um, I just wanted to say thank you to both the city and the county for the investment in uh, new development. I know that supply is such an enormous challenge for our communities. Um, and so that investment in developing new affordable housing is really important. And so thank you for that. Uh, and then just a continued sort of push on not leaving out that home ownership opportunity to really advance individuals and, and help them move on that trajectory for long-term growth and wealth. And, and so advocating a bit more for continued investment in that while it is challenging, there is definitely a, not enough funds to go around, but thank you for all you're doing. Thank you so much for that, Megan. And then the next question came in on the chat which was from Katie Gannon. And Katie, if you could share whether you're an individual community member or you're affiliated with an organization, what organization that is, and you can just throw that in the chat if you'd like, but we have to connect every individual to an organization if they are representing one. Um, the So Katie um, said, you probably already answered this, but is this year's funding the same as last year? 
So it is not the same as last year. And we don't actually know, oh, thanks, Katie. Katie is with Tucson Clean and Beautiful. Um, we actually don't have the final allocations for the coming year. So as Susan mentioned in the presentation, all of our projections um, from this presentation are based on the current year's funding because we're waiting for HUD to release the new year's, the new year's funding dollar amounts exactly by community. Um, what we do know is that we will likely see some reductions, um, probably a small reduction in the community development block grant program, pretty minor, um, generally speaking, um, and then a more significant reduction in the home investment investment partnerships program. We saw nationally, we saw a 17% reduction in the recent transportation and HUD bill that was approved by Congress. Um, so we will we'll see those numbers go down a little bit. Um, and the way that that will work is if um, everything will decrease or increase proportional to the amount of the total increase or decrease. So if everything goes, if the funding went up by 5%, then DPA will, down payment assistance will go up by 5%, gap financing by 5%, right? It's um, sort of everything will move together based on that final financing. Then the next question came from Camille Lang in with her hand up. So we'll go back to Camille and I believe Camille's with the Arizona Center for Empowerment. Um, thank you again. Um, so I have a question then um, with the talks about uh, allowing on a state level for like different faith-based organizations to get involved with the development of affordable housing properties, where would their funding fall into this or would it be outside of the um, federal and county, like city and county funding that we discussed today? Yeah, and so Camille, are you referencing the Yes in God's Backyard? Yes, the Yes in Bill. God's Backyard Bill. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So that is an entirely separate, um, it is, those are state funds um, that are potentially being allocated. And so um, is entirely outside of this presentation today. And honestly, I, you know, others from the county may be able to speak in more detail on it. I sat in one 30 minute briefing on it. And so have just, I'm sure you know more about that bill than I do. Thanks. Uh, if anyone from the county has an answer, that'd be great. Uh, I'm trying to get some clarity on it myself. I'm, I'm afraid the county folks you've got online here are, are not able to answer that. Apologies. <laughs> Thank you all for your time. Thanks so much. And Camille, someone, um, you know, an entity that would potentially be good to connect with on that would be to reach out to the Arizona Housing Coalition. Um, and you can, you know, if you just Google Arizona Housing Coalition, they're really the state advocacy arm related to affordable housing and have been very involved in that bill. Um, so they would probably be a great source of information. Thank you so much. Sure thing. Then our next question, we've got Betty Bitgood has her hand up and then we have a question from Hannah Cree in the chat. So we'll begin with Betty. Oh, it looks like you're muted, Betty. I already, you already answered my question. Oh, great. Okay. Thanks so much. All right, so then our next question comes from Hannah Cree, who says, I'm a reporter with Arizona Public Media. I was wondering how fast the emergency solutions grant funds for rapid rehousing and homelessness prevention were used up this year. Is there any potential expansion of those funds in the future? Um, so happy to answer that from a city perspective to the best extent that we can, not having data right in front of us, um, and then can ping that over to the county. So on our side, um, for rapid rehousing, um, that funding generally is gone in the first six to eight months of the year. Um, it serves a very small number of households and for a short period of time, we specifically fund a domestic violence rapid rehousing program at Emerge Center Against Domestic Abuse. That's the only rapid rehousing through the Emergency Solutions Grant Program that the city funds. And so they use that funding to help folks exit their shelters. For a, And so it's very brief assistance. Um, and then our homelessness prevention funding sort of similarly is in a very specific population. It's used with public housing residents who are facing eviction because of non-payment of rent and it's to keep people who came from homelessness or extreme um, low income 
in poverty situations from um, becoming homeless again because of they're not able to make their portion of a rental payment. And so on that program, I would, I'm would i not sure kind of the timing on expenditure, um, but know that that money moves pretty quickly as well. And then I'll punt that over to Joel and crew from the county perspective. Sure, thanks, Jason. My apologies to everybody and Hannah. We're a little shorthanded over here. None of our ESG folks are on. Um, just to echo what Jason said, the last is this is not a lot of money and it does go very fast. Um, the agencies try to to braid other funds in best they can and the outlays are often small bits, but it does not last long. And, and the, the last part of your question, uh, I don't think there's any, any hope for potential expansion of those funds in the new future. This is a congressional allocation as far as I understand. So, um, and it's a formula allocation again. So um, I, I don't think there's much movement on there. Possibly. And in the current, so the current transportation HUD bill that just passed con Congress did see an increase in homeless assistance programs, which is the, the line item in the federal bill. That includes two programs. It includes the Emergency Solutions Grant Program. It also includes the Continuum of Care Program, which is entirely separate and not an entitlement program. Um, and so we don't yet know how much is going to each of those programs um, in that increase in allocation. My guess is we may see a modest increase in, in the Emergency Solutions Grant funding this year, but I truly mean that to be modest. You may be talking about a couple thousand dollar increase, if any. Right, it looks like then, so um, Betty had mentioned questions already answered, so I've lowered her hand. I don't see any other questions in, or comments in the chat or hands up. Is there anything else anyone would like to share? Sort of last call. Okay, if not, I'll turn it back over to Susan for the conclusion of the presentation. Thank you, Jason. So the final slide is basically uh, letting everyone know that the Spanish uh, language public needs hearing is tonight at 5.30. It will go from 5.30 to 6.30. So if you would like to register for that, you can. Um, the email address or the registration link is right here in, um, in this slide. Um, for public comment from April 4th to May 6th, uh, please make sure that if you have any other public comments, um, you, you at least uh, try to get them in during this time frame. The draft annual action plan uh, will be posted at the tucsonaz.gov HCD site. Um, and finally, with the public county um, public hearing, Board of Supervisors, that will be May 7th at 9 a.m. And the City of Tucson public hearing with the Mayor and Council is going to be May 7th as well at 5.30 p.m. And with that, thank you all for attending. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason, for all your help. Thanks so much.